Yep. And actually this year, they're much quicker than they were a few years ago. Um, in like when I applied, I think I had like at least, there were at least six weeks before the um, first interview, but this year it's it's been um, it's been like a week or so. Okay, I think I'm gonna start. So, we begin. So yeah, pediatric SD1 interviews is what we're gonna be talking about today. And my name is Dr. Radhika Thakra. I am a pediatric ST3 at um, a hospital in London. And um, I remember how hard it was applying when I was ST1. To be honest, people didn't even do mock interviews or anything like this when I was applying. It's really happened over the last few years. Um, and um, so I decided to do this webinar to help people. I wanted to do mocks, but I don't have the time at the moment to arrange mocks, so I thought this would be the next best thing. So, um, oh, so aims of this session is just to outline the interview structure and go through each of the four components of the interview, and then we can do a bit of a Q&A at the end as well. Um, it's aimed at people who are having interviews this coming year for to, to start pediatric training in um, September 2023. It's not particularly aimed at medical students or F1s, particularly um, because it does sometimes change. But if there are any medical students or F1s here, you're welcome to stay and listen, or just people who aren't applying but here for more knowledge. Um, and I just want to caveat that there's nothing specific for IMGs, but many things will be applicable. Also to add to that, there's nothing specific for ST3 or 4 um, interviews, because I have not taken part in that process and I don't know a lot about it. Um, but again, things might be helpful and applicable. So um, that's just something to bear in mind. So just to go through the timeline again, a lot of you will have seen this and know this, this timeline very well. But essentially we are here where the um, interview windows are now open from next week. Yeah, from next week, um, which is so soon. Um, and I'm sure many of you will have your interview already. Um, and um, the interviews will take place o mostly over February and the beginning of March. And then you'll hear about whether or not you have an offer at the end of March. This is just to go through. So although it says that, although there's a region um, assigned to each date, it doesn't actually meet that. That doesn't really have much bearing on you because the interviews are online. Um, so I wouldn't stress about that. I wouldn't even think about it, to be honest. Just um, you can just do your interview with whichever one it is. And I know you've already got your interview dates, but it doesn't have any relevance really on your actual um, interview itself, other than who's managing the interview and probably where the interviewers will be from. Um, so just to go through the format of the interview, many of you will know this. Um, so it's a 40 minute virtual interview. Um, my interview was face to face. I was the last year face to face, um, but they've been doing virtual interviews over the last three years now. So the way it's run is that they're going to do two 20 minute stations. So you'll have 20 minutes with two interviewers and then you'll switch stations and do another 20 minutes with another two interviewers. Um, you'll do station one will be the communication section and the career motivation section. And then station two will be clinical reasoning and your reflective practice. And as I said, you'll have two clinicians scoring you and then their scores will be collated together at the end and also just um, moderated as well slightly just to check that they're similar. Um, and then to go through, so I'm pretty sure this is the timings. They haven't explicitly stated this on any of the RCPCH documentation, but they said that the 20 minutes will be spared, will be shared evenly. So everyone, all of your interviews will start with the communication station. So you'll have your five minutes to read and to think for the communication station, and then you'll have the 10 minute scenario. And we'll go through that in more detail. Then you have your career motivation and portfo slash portfolio station. And then that's when you then switch your interviewers and your clinicians are scoring and then you'll have a reflective practice and your clinical thinking and I assume these will be 10 minutes um, but don't quote me on that because it hasn't they haven't actually stated anywhere how long each one will be so they've said that the whole thing should be done in 45 minutes so actually sorry that top thing should say 45 not 40. So um, it's this year they're using a system called Cupacom. Um, I've not used it before, but I just thought I would just sh show you. This is a picture we got off the internet to show what it looks like. So they will. this is for what it will look like for the interviewer. So they'll be marking you at the same time as having you on their screen. Um, and for when you log in, um, it will be a similar format. But like I said, I've not used this before, but this is a new thing that RCPCH are using this year. Um, and it's just helpful to kind of know what it will look like. So 
we'll go through the communication station first of all. So I've taken, for each section, I've just taken screenshots of exactly what the applicant guidance says on the RCPCH website. So um, I'm, as I'm sure many of you have read this, and if you haven't, I would strongly recommend that you do. But just to go through the communication um, station and what they've written, the main things are that they're going to assess your ability to interact with the patient, parent or carer. Um, and then they've said that this scenario will involve either an explanation of a clinical condition or reasons for an intervention or transfer. Um, I think that this we'll go th we'll go through some of my thoughts, but I think there are some other things you should think about as well as explanation and reasons. Um, and it will just be you and the role player. So when you log on, um, when, when you have your first five minutes to think about, and then when it gets onto the Cupacom system, there'll only be one person there, and that will be the actor. Um, and they, the assessors will then be marking what, what points they're given. They'll be marking you on the points that they've been given and the scoring framework. So, um, like I said, you'll see the actor, um, and the actor will either be the patient themselves or the parent. So it's probably useful at the beginning, just like you do, in, you would have done at medical school, just say, can I just check, am I talking to, you know, like, Ka um, Catherine, and are you Catherine's mum, or can I just check, am I talking to Catherine, you're the patient, just to help with yourself, especially because you're kind of trying to overcome some of the differences of having, having it online. Um... And then I think it's just really, it will be really helpful to have a think about how do you should use your five minutes. Um, so obviously you're going to read the scenario and you're going to be really nervous and your heart's going to be beating really fast. So first of all, I would say use that five minutes just to help calm yourself down. Um, so read the scenario, take some deep breaths and compose your thoughts because this can be a really useful amount of time just to help think, how am I going to, how am I going to tackle this or how am I going to do this communication station? So it's useful to think, well, first of all, what kind of questions are you going to start with? And I think that's really useful to have in your head so that once they, once they, um, once they start talking to you, you kind of know what my first thoughts. Um, then, um, so the things you should think about, again, is clarifying who they are. Um, I think it's quite useful, especially in these sorts of things, just to clarify what they understand so far. And it's hard for me to give you exact thoughts because it depends it's, it's nuanced per, as per the situation and the scenario but it might be helpful to kind of ask them like what do you understand so far or can we, can I just clarify a few things just so that you can get yourself into the mode of, of the consultation um, it might also be helpful to think about what kind of reactions they might have so maybe just kind of building a little bit of a mind map in your head um, do you like so say for example say um this is just an example of making up on the spot but say the scenario says you've been asked to speak to the parents of a patient or let's say the dad of a patient who's angry about the treatment plan so i guess you could think what kind of classical responses might they have and what direction so they might get more angry they might actually be upset about something they um might dis they might agree with you or they might completely disagree with you so kind of just think how might this go and how would i tackle each one that's that might be useful to think about and then i guess i guess how would you define it to be a success so obviously if you're if you end up saying well we've got to get a court order to have your child have this treatment that's not necessarily a successful communication um but if you end up having a collaborative approach to this child's management plan that's what you would kind of think of as a successful communication so just in your head kind of have that that light uh, at the end of the tunnel of what exactly do i want to aim for here so i'm going to go through some communication things these might seem very um obvious or they might not um, and they might seem like you might think radical we're not a medical school but i'm just going through these because these this is what you're being tested on um, and they actually say in in the applicant guidance and on some of the um, content that the rcpch have online that they're kind of expecting you to be at a level of an f2 so you're not a registrar you're not a consultant you're not even an st1 or two they kind of say that you're at f2 level um, so although these things might seem obvious, especially when you're nervous and especially because you probably haven't done an interview before um, or very few people in our, at this point have done interviews before. I definitely hadn't really done one. Um, it's good to think about these sorts of things. So always remember to introduce yourself and establish that rapport. Introducing yourself can seem so basic, but just make sure you do it. And again, you do that day to day at work. So it will help just kind of ground yourself and get you into the flow a little bit. And then, like I said earlier, checking their understanding and just checking the context. I've always found that quite a helpful way. So when I did my clinicals, especially, I found that quite a helpful way to kind of just make sure I understood the situation a bit more and make sure I didn't like 
don't I didn't assume anything from the clinical scenario because it's quite easy to assume things based on the scenario but kind of just use this interaction with the patient or with the parent actor to double check what what's what's a fact I guess and anything that's not really important the actor will kind of sway you I, I think personally that the actor will kind of sway you in, in the right direction but obviously that's just my own thought um, as usual, give the patient and parent or give the actor, the person you're talking to time to speak. That's just as it is when we speak to our own patients. Just let them talk if, if they want to talk. You might have a scenario where actually they don't want to talk. And obviously you need to take things a bit, bit um, in a different direction, but give them time. I think even the use of silence can be really powerful. If, if you have a quiet patient or a patient who's upset or angry, still give use the pauses effectively to kind of give them that time to speak if they want to. And again, some actors may then kind of use that silence appropriately to then fill it in and tell you what they want to say. So just be mindful that I know even though it's an assessment, an interview, it's nerve wracking, using time and using silence appropriately can really help. Now, don't forget the importance of nonverbal communication, and that's even harder on an online interview. And like I said, I didn't do an online interview, so so it, it, these are just the sorts of things that I really think are important for when you are having an interview online. So um, nonverbal communication, I think the things that really help is nodding frequently, um, just to show that you're actively listening. Eye contact, and that's hard, but you, eye contact with your camera particularly um, can really help. Um, obviously you've got to you've got to balance that with looking at the patient or looking at the screen to look at the patient but tr kind of trying to give eye contact um, and look up at the camera or to, to make them feel that you're looking at them and your posture is also really important so don't like lean back in your chair even right now while I'm talking to you I'm leaning forwards even though you can't see me I'm leaning forwards I'm actually using my hands so d do use that non-verbal communication as well or if you're having to explain something the use of your hands can be really helpful as well so just like the first thing we're going to do is this the second thing we're going to do is that use your hands appropriately but just because you're on a computer and there's a screen there kind of try to pretend that's not there and that there's a real person in front of you and this is a really good thing you can practice um, and I'll talk about practicing at the end but it's a really good thing you can practice and um, also I think it's really helpful to record yourself if you're practicing so so literally try and get a friend um, to do a zoom call with you and do a practice online scenario and practice how you're going to do your non-verbal communication and see what your friend thinks and then if you screen record it then you can also review that and, and judge it yourself um, make sure you use a good mix of open and closed questions. Again, seems very basic, but that kind of thing scores you marks from what I understand. So just just make sure you use use that appropriately. And even when you're at work, coming up to it, even if you're not doing formal interview practice, just think, actually, if I were in a scenario right now, am I using open and closed questions appropriately and in a, in a good way? Now, um, summarizing and checking knowledge, I think, is always a really good and important thing to do. Um, part, I think it also helps me as a doctor or even in, or if, if you're in an interview, it will help you just to kind of gather your thoughts and make sure you're not missing anything and make sure you haven't misunderstood anything. So that's something I did a lot when I was doing my communication stations for my clinical exams. And just to clarify or just to go over what you told me so far, there's, um, you're upset about this and this is the kind of thing that's going on and this is kind of how we can support you. Am I right in thinking that? or yeah obviously it will change as per the scenario but those are the sorts of things to think about and then signposting as well so okay so we've talked about uh, so I find signposting really helpful especially if you've got an angry patient or an upset patient or parent you can say okay I, I really I appreciate what you've been saying and I understand your concerns and um, I've, I've taken it on board and I, there's a lot to think about and talk about but why don't we move forward and think about what we can do now so if you ever feel like you're getting in a rut and um, you're not really moving and you, you're, you feel like you're going around in circles I think signposting can be a really useful tool then as well to help move it along or as you would in a normal situation just to help naturally move the conversation on to the next part so okay so I've talked to you about what's brought you in today why don't we talk a bit more about your child's background just to help flow, flow the conversation and show the patient and parent the, the chunks that you're doing um, and then please do not forget your ice 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 baby <laughs> um, uh, to be honest we, we often forget to do I forget to do this sometimes when I see patients but I, I think I probably ask it in different ways but please don't forget to to say like what is there anything you're particularly worried about was there anything you were hoping for from today you know is there anything you think might be going on you know your ice questions you learned it at medical school but do not let do not forget this when you are um, when you're doing this scenario so if uh, I think in your five minutes just remind yourself as well I've got to think of ice like your communication stage will be your first scenario you can remember 
ice. Um, maybe you just think, I don't want the ice to melt, so I've got to ask it. And um, I think it's helpful. I, I often say it's quite a good idea to ask it more than once, not in such an overt way, not like, is there anything, you're, not the exact three questions, but just in a, in, a, in a probing way, like, is there anything else you're worried about? Or is there anything else we haven't talked about that you want to mention? Um, is there anything I haven't covered? Those sorts of questions can really help. And especially when it's an actor, um, that can give them the opportunity to give you the information that, that might really help the scenario. So I think those are useful things to think about. Um, so these are the sorts of things I just have have thought of that come commonly come up in communication stations. That's a tongue twister, um, and especially for when I was revising for my clinicals, the sorts of things that I I thought about and revised um, and practiced. So you might need to explain a procedure or an investigation, um, and I would think about common pediatric types of procedures and investigations as well to to kind of help prepare for this. Um, resolving conflicts so that might be between as in it, yeah to be honest no so resolving conflicts yeah that might be between um an angry parent or an angry patient like a teenager those are the sorts of things to think about um lifestyle factors so they can actually be they don't necessarily have to be in an acute situation it could be in a clinic setting and communicating um say for example patients that aren't complying to medication or treatment plans or things that might be implementing their lifestyle um, breaking bad news is always an important one and one that can come up. Um, so I think uh, uh, people do often use that book, um, the oh, I can't, ISC book, but that one, that book covers quite well breaking bad news and how you can go about it um, in a professional way. Duty of candor, so that's always a really useful thing to mention. And just keep that in the back of your mind for all of the stations. Just is, is does duty of candor relevant anywhere? Do I need to have a duty of candor conversation and talk about um, errors um, and why they happened and how we'll make sure they don't happen in the future? Chronic conditions, so patients with chronic conditions that you might see in clinic or um, on the ward or in A and E, there might be communication from that perspective. And then I think safeguarding would be quite a tricky one to come up, um, but. I guess that might be one worth practicing or at least thinking about how you might answer um, safeguarding and just saying, um, so we have concerns that you're, you're that, so say, say a baby is brought in with bruises, um, like a three month old baby is brought in with bruises. You could say things like, um, we're really worried about your baby as I'm sure you're worried too, um, but we'd like to investigate them further. And first of all, just make sure that there's nothing medical going on, but also if anyone's caused these bruises to the, to ba to the baby and how we can keep baby as safe as possible. There's different ways of, of having safeguarding conversations and I would be surprised if they came up in your interview. Um, they're more of a th sort of thing that come up in clinicals, which is when you're, when you're doing your exams to become a registrar kind of. Um, but I think it's just something to just make sure you think about and have a bit of a refresh on. Um, I wanted to just highlight that it's not necessarily your medical knowledge that's being tested and it is your communication skills, particularly in this station. So don't use it as a chance to be like, okay, well, why don't we start you on this, 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 and this? And kind of you make sure you might be able to link some medical knowledge in and that's great, but don't think that medical knowledge is going to be the answer or like an operation is going to be the answer to the communication scenario. It's going to be more obviously about how you communicate and the conversations you're having. Um, and just some things that the issue might underlie in is potentially a misunderstanding or has the patient misunderstood have they had previous bad experiences or is there anything else going on in their life? Like, I think there's a classic scenario where you've got an angry parent who doesn't want to stay in overnight, but it's actually because their car parking is about to run out and they can't afford to pay for parking overnight. And actually, is there something else we can help with to help resolve the situation? So you kind of just think outside the box. Is there anything else that might be going on? I'm just going to have a drink of water. Bear with. <clears throat> okay. So now moving on to the motivation slash portfolio station. Um, and they've renamed this to motivation because when I applied, you actually brought in a portfolio. You brought in, um, I think there was only 12 sides of paper we were allowed. So it's very different to surgical portfolios where they bring in like a massive book. Um, but we were allowed to bring in a 12 page portfolio, um, which they now longer do not require. And they, they say you could have your own virtual selected portfolio that basically means a portfolio in your head. They're not expecting to show, you're not expected to show anything. They're not expecting to see anything. Um, it essentially just means a, 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 a think in your head about the sort of things you'd want to talk about or the things you're proud of and the things you'd want to mention. 
Um, but the main port part of this station, as they say, is you, they want to see your enthusiasm, suitability, suitability and motivation for a career in pediatrics. Um, and that's kind of when you're thinking about the station, you basically are going in thinking, I want them to know that I really want to be a pediatrician and I really understand what it's like to be a pediatrician. I know what it involves and I want them to know that I want to be one. So that's the kind of point of the station. Um, just remember that in this station they and in the whole interview process, they don't have access to your white space questions. Um, they basically don't use your white space questions again. So other than in like a few situations, which if your interview score is the same as someone else's, then they go back to your white space questions. That's the only time they look at them again as a as the app in the application process. Um, so just think if you have a just don't assu obviously don't assume they know anything from your white space questions because they don't even have access to it and think what are your main things that you put in your application form as well that you'd really want these interviewers to know um that makes you such a great person and such a will make you such a great pediatrician and they also say that they don't actually have to be clinically relevant as long as they can be used to demonstrate um, relevant skills and attributes and then again you'll have the two interviewers who have a scoring framework and they will mark you against the scoring framework so I had to think of the sort of things they might ask. Again, these are just things I've thought of. Um, and also just to caveat generally, I'm not part of RCPCH or anything. I'm just an ST3 who's giving some advice um, just so that I've got that caveat and uh, um, disclaimer in there. Um, but just some things to think of. So why do you want to pursue a career in pediatrics? I think that's a really obvious question that they're really likely to ask because this whole thing is about your motivation um, about pediatrics. So I, I can't give you the answers and I can't tell you why you want to do a career in pediatrics and that's not what this webinar is about, but just some useful things to think about. Um, so be yourself, be genuine, be enthusiastic. Interviewers can see your enthusiasm. They've also will have interviewed probably multiple people that day. So um, I would genuinely be yourself and, and be enthusiastic and share any personal experiences that you have had or any particular moments that have made you realize why you want to do pediatrics. I think my answer was... I'd done an F2 job in pediatrics. I really, really enjoyed it. It was the first job I'd done where I looked forward to going to work and I didn't want the rotation to end. I really like being around children. I've grown up with lots of children in my life and I, I think there's no better job than working with children every day. Um, I think it was something like that, but I can't really remember. Um, what attributes do you think make a good pediatrician and why do you think you would make a good pediatrician? So I kind of link those two together, but they could easily be separated or combined. Um, but I would try and think of a few attributes and also link these back. To, if you can, if the conversation flows in that way and you have time, link these back to yourself. Remember, this is a 10 minute station. So I, I think they would probably ask you four to five questions. Um, but again, that will vary on the interviewers and on your answering. Um, so attributes that make you that make a good pediatrician. So I would think organized um, because there's lots of different like lots of things to do as a pediatrician. You need to make sure you're keeping on top of it. Resilient. Um, you you see lots of unwell children. You see patients die, and that can be really really sad. And you need to be resilient. You need to have coping mechanisms um, for these sort of sad situations. And I would think to link it back to myself times where I have shown resilience and developed my resilience was during the COVID pandemic where I was working in A&E and we'd see lots of really unwell patients and it was really sad and seeing these patients on their own um, and how I would be one of the only people that they saw during lockdown um, and it made me feel really sad but I it gave me the it gave me the reminder that I needed to do my best for the, this patient whether that be help get them better or die respectfully it's my responsibility to to do my very best for this patient. So those sorts of things of how I have, and then in that answer, I've kind of brought resilience and also um, skills of like other clinical skills in that as well. So yeah, just think about what makes a good pediatrician and link it back to yourself. Teamwork, leadership, um, those are all things that make a good pediatrician in my opinion. Communication is a huge one as well. Um, you kind of and also just liking liking being around children that's that's a key attribute you, you want to enjoy being around children um and whether that be a baby or a teenager um what challenges do you recognize in the career so i think i, I don't know if they would ask this but it's a good question to kind of think of um kind of a good question to make sure that the person that they're interviewing has a good understanding of the challenges because you know you don't want people to apply to this job and actually they think it's great and there's no challenges when there really are um so have a think about those sorts of things like um the rotor difficult shift patterns like i said already patients dying patients being unwell um 
moving around like and in your deanery that can sometimes be a challenge but yeah kind of have a think of those and I guess I already talked about the resilience one but link it back to yourself and um, how you've managed these challenges or um, being very busy so you could talk about I, I know that being a pediatrician is very busy but I I try and manage this by keeping organized making sure I have a really good job this making sure I do the most important things first um, so yeah um, how do you cope with stress so I think this is quite a common question in um, interviews. I think I got this in my medical school interview actually. Um, but I think it's important to be practical, honest, and also quite general. So I, get, I think I would probably answer this question in, if I'm stressed acutely, like on the ward, I like to take a step back, work out what I can do now, delegate jobs if I need to, or talk to someone if I need help. Um, but then if I'm stressed generally in life, I think taking time to talk to someone close to me, um, talk about how I'm feeling, think about what kind of things I can do, even things like having a cup of tea, having t uh, time to wind down, going to the gym. So, you know, you can you can kind of answer that kind of question in multiple ways, like stressed on the ward, stressed at work or stressed in life or stressed when you're at home about what happened at work. But kind of have a think about different ways you could answer that and any kind of question like that. Um, so the portfolio, t I think... They, I think in the, um, I think in the applicant guidance, they kind of assume that they they will ask you about this portfolio that's in your head, um, but when they might ask you kind of tell us about your portfolio, what are you most proud of? Um, so think about certain things that you would definitely want to talk about. Again, these are probably things you would have mentioned in your white space question application, um, and yeah things you can mention like if you did a really good audit or a quip if you won an award like if you won an anything at medical school or you've won any prizes afterwards like they have an rcpch prize if you're proud of that um even things like your your team assessment and behavior from f1 and f2 like that's that can be a really nice thing to mention that's a really nice way of almost showing off in a humble way like i was really proud of my um team assessment and behavior I was really um it was really nice to see what the nurses and the other members of the multidisciplinary team thought of me and it showed me that I need to have more confidence in myself and that I um I should believe in myself and that I'm doing a good job and I'm going to take this this confidence forward um for when I become a pediatric trainee so that I can kind of enjoy work more and build on my confidence and build on my clinical skills so taking that taking that achievement but then also projecting it onto when I'm a pediatrician this is how I'm going to use the skills that I've done when I'm going forward um and yeah so they might also ask like tell us about an audit or a quality improvement project you've done and then you can use this as a chance to think about your enthusiasm for pediatrics and your skills and even if it's not a pediatric related audit or quip you can talk about how you've done something else and you've now got skills so that when you become a pediatric trainee you can do more of these sorts of things um and then they kind of allude to in some of the online content especially there's a webinar youtube webinar which i have mentioned at the end but it's a, it's just on the rcpca youtube channel um, and it's also on the RCPCH ST1 applicant guide, but they allude to role role modeling questions. So kind of, I would just have a think about um, who is a role model to you and why they're a role model to you. And when you answer this, think about what attributes they have and why you value those attributes and then why they will make you a good pediatrician. So I think I would just have a good think about that, that kind of question and how you would answer it um, and, and how you'd answer it well, not just like, my mum's a role model to me because she's great but like how you would actually answer that question well not just who you would say um but they do kind of allude to role modeling in the online content fine so now we are on to clinical reasoning so um, what time is it oh my gosh it's already been half an hour so um now we're on to clinical reasoning so <clears throat> this is where they say that they'll give you a scenario so this is also going to be when you switch your um to assessors a scenario where they ask you to describe the relevant issues and how you would uh, they will ask you to describe the relevant issues and then also how you would manage the situation um, and they say it's at f2 level they've literally written that in the applicant guidance that you should be at f2 level not even sd1 level f2 level um, and they want they want a clear and methodical approach and they want you to consider your own level and ability so please just keep these things in mind when you're going into your interview and you're preparing for your interview. Um, these are the sorts of things that they, they want you to think about. So these are just my thoughts on how to approach the clinical reasoning um, question. And they are looking for safe and competent pediatricians or pediatric trainees. So just bear that in mind. Um, I, I, 
I've written this first point saying don't be afraid to ask questions to ensure you understand the scenario. I, I don't know exactly, just to be honest here, I don't know exactly how this scenario runs, but I think it's a little bit more of a question and answer back and forth from the interviewers and from you. Um, but I, I'm not sure. Um, but I think that if they do say anything that you don't understand, then don't be afraid to just clarify clarify the odd thing here and there. Um, also, just I know it's, again, really tempting to rush, really tempting to just blurt out your answer. But take a few seconds to think how you would structure it. Um, and also the important things you wouldn't forget about. So I think the really important thing is don't forget A to E. Um, there might be some situations when A to E isn't necessarily appropriate or if, if there's something really urgent, like say the patient's in anaphylaxis, A, well, I guess your air, airway is compromised by the, like, by the bronchoconstriction, so you need to give the adrenaline, but you kind of use your A to E appropriately, but sometimes you might not, not necessarily follow the strict structure, but I think A to E is the most sensible and safest way to go about it. Um, think about practical things like if you were actually in a think about your A&E if it's if they say you're in A&E think about your own A&E what would you actually do if you saw this patient in front of you so say you had a patient in anaphylaxis you would probably pull the emergency buzzer you'd probably call for help and you'd probably put out a double two call so you could say all those things at the beginning like I'm, and, and say I'm worried about this patient um, I'd like to pull the emergency buzzer ask for help and ask someone to put out a double two double two call to get more help and then you say and then I'll go and make my ATE assessment because you're not just going to do those things and walk off you're going to actually do your assessment and do things so you uh, so yeah go through your ATE and talk about how you would manage it um as i as i've said already remember you're an f2 so in this as in as they've said it's f2 level so you're an f2 sd1 but you're not a registrar or a consultant so just make sure that you um, know your limitations and escalate appropriately so so even dealing with an unwell patient on their own that's almost understanding your limitation you can say that like i feel like i need more help with this and that, that i it's not appropriate for me to manage this on my own so i would ask for extra help and in the meantime do what i can um until help arrives um and you might also want to think about things like why are you escalating? So say you've got a seizing patient who's in status, like I would call anesthetics to help support the airway. Or if you have a patient with, um, oh my gosh, what was I going to say? If you have a patient, okay, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, know who you'll call and why. Um, and if you don't know how to do something or you don't know the answer to something, um, don't lie, don't try and guess. I think the best thing is just to say you'll look it up or you'll look at the guidelines or you'll find out. So say you've got a patient in status and you can't remember the first line of status epilepticus or all you can remember it's a benzodiazepine you can't remember what else it is. Just say I'll look at the APLS guidelines and give the first line treatment which I believe is a benzodiazepine but I'd like to double check it. Um, those sorts of things. Just just be safe. Don't make things up and, and guess because that's not safe, is it? If it? The interviewer wouldn't want you to be doing that to their actual patient. Um, and just think about the other things you can refer to. So I've already mentioned APLS, which is acute pediatric life support. You can also think about your local guidelines um, and micro guide for things like antibiotics, um, nice guidelines. Just have a think about the sorts of things you can refer to. Um, you might be able to, it would be like quite nice to get in there that I would give an SBAR handover. So if, it, if that comes up, like if if they say okay well your your reg has arrived what were you going to do you can say well i'd give them an s-bar handover and explain to them and some they might even say to you well, can you please can you please pretend i'm the registrar and explain to me what's been going on like they might even do that um and basics of history taking you might again it would depend on the scenario but you might be able to ask a few questions at the beginning or you might not but just have a think as to whether or not um that's appropriate and you can ask a few questions to to set yourself the scene Things I would revise if I had to only revise a few things. These were some things I just thought of, um, but like the very pediatric -y topics. So sepsis, obviously, seizures I've already mentioned and status, asthma management, bronchiolitis, anaphylaxis, type 1 diabetes, safeguarding. I would revise those sorts of things just to so just so that you feel a bit more comfortable with them. And then I have a golden rule. Um, someone told it. To, someone said it to me when I was revising for clinicals. But just always think: could this be sepsis, non-accidental injury, or oncology? Just always think: am I missing that? And I kind of now do always think that even in patients I see, like in A and E. So always think about those three things. Um, that's not like a general golden rule in peds. It's just my own one. But just that's a useful thing to think about. Just that you don't um, you don't feel like you're missing anything, any of the really important things that could be going on. Um, fine is that all four stations reflection crim oh no there's still one more oh sorry no sorry 
Ignore me. Um, and then I also put things, um, think like a pediatrician. Sorry, I thought I put this slide at the end. But anyway, um, think like a pediatrician. So um, think about, I feel like I've put this slide in the wrong place. Let's go back to this slide. Um, so let's go into the reflective practice section. So um, this reflective practice, they literally tell you what they're going to ask you. So if there is anything you prepare for this interview is please prepare this because this is screenshot from the guidance and they literally say assessors will ask the following and they tell you the two questions they're going to ask. Please could you briefly describe a significant clinical event you were involved with or observed and discuss your learning from it and how do you use similar reflective practice in your daily work? Um, and they um, have said that they want you to spend minimum the minimum time describing the event and your involvement and the majority of the time on your reflection. Um, and they also want to know how you're applying your experiences to your future career. They literally say that at the top, how they apply their experiences to their career progression. So just make sure you're aware of all of these things when you're preparing and when you're answering your question. So please could you briefly describe a clinical event you were involved in and you're learning from it. So I've just had to think about what you could talk about. So first of all, the clinical event, make sure you make your description brief. Don't choose something that's too complicated. So w please just make sure you decide your event and practiced saying it before your interview because they're telling you they're gonna ask you this. Don't don't wing it, There's you don't need to wing it, you should prepare it. So when you choose your event, um, make sure it's not too complicated to explain because you're gonna waste your own time explaining it. Um, so you should yeah, try and try and if you've got to just try and think of a few options and maybe go through them with a friend or a colleague um, and just think which one would actually make which one would be the most appropriate. Um, then I would just explain your own role in this situation. Like, were you the F1 observing? Were you the F2 leading it? Were, like kind of just explain how you fit into the whole context. But don't, again, don't spend too much time on that. Um, please, please, please make sure there's nothing identifiable. Um, just because you would immediately lose a lot of marks for that. And obviously that goes against um, any GMC um, advice. So just make sure there's nothing identifiable in it and make it very anonymous. So the things to think about, you can think about where, I, I've kind of split it into where something went wrong or where something went well. Um, so where something went wrong, so like a prescribing error, any significant incidents either that you've seen or that you've been involved in, um, any poor teamwork that, that you've noticed, any misunderstandings that could be between patients and um, doctors or that could be between between doctors and like interdisciplinary misunderstandings or it could be like systemic organization related um, problems and then things about where something went well so if you notice that teams working together well um, a good resuscitation um, people someone advocating for their patient so it could be a doctor advocating for their patient or it could be a parent advocating for their patient but those are the sort of things that you could think about there are obviously many many more but these are just some i've thought of um so i'll just tell you oh yeah so then when you when you want to discuss so then to discuss your learning from it the sorts of things i would think about is first of all what did you, so once you described the event what did you see that happened and then what did you learn from it um well, what did you see other people do? And what did you learn from that? So what did you learn from what other people did? What did you learn from what you had to do or what you were asked to do or what you actually did? And think about the clinical and non-clinical things. So, so I don't know, thinking off the top of my... Well, I guess I can tell you, so for my, my interview, because I also had this question, I had recently gone to coroner's court for a patient who was very unwell and um, died unexpectedly. So I guess for the what did... When I was thinking about... So first of all, I talked about what happened, but again, briefly... Um, and then I talked about the process of going to coroner's court. Um, what did I learn? So then I, I talked about, first of all, the clinical side of things. So what I learned about what went wrong. Um, and then I also talked about the non-clinical things. So they talked about the process of significant investigations, going to coroner's court, datexes, the whole process, because that's a very different process. And again, I hope many of you, I hope you haven't had the experience of going to coroner's court or being involved in an SI. But if you have, those are the sorts of things I think you could probably get drawing quite a lot you, you could use quite well in this kind of question. Um, and then think about how you've applied this to your practice. So uh, it, for me, it was, um, I was thinking about, well, first of all, if I were to see that clinical situation again, how would I apply my learning from that scenario to my practice? And just to clarify, I didn't like do anything single-handedly. It was just multiple things happened and I was working that day. So that's why I was in coroner's court. But obviously I learned a lot from it, but just to clarify that. But yeah, um, thinking about... Um, how I've applied it to, 
how I've applied it to my practice. So yeah, how, what I would do if I saw that event, but then also thinking about mistakes, errors, um, SIs. So my understanding of that whole process completely changed and how I view them completely changed. And then also kind of my thinking around mistakes and errors within hospitals also changed because I, I'd kind of been involved in one. Um, and then think about what you do differently. So duty of candor is a really good one to mention here. I know I m- mentioned it earlier, but I think it's also really important to mention here. And I think it's a good it's a good phrase to get in um, is having duty of candor conversations. And for anyone that doesn't know, that essentially means duty of candor means having an open conversation with with par- with I was going to say parents with patients about things that might have gone wrong and kind of openly explaining that things have happened and and exploring why they've happened um you can also talk about datex and incident reporting and kind of your understanding of how that makes a difference um shared learning so one thing i remember very clearly saying in my interviews that i've told people about the case so that they can learn from from what happened obviously in an anonymous way but i've just shared that my own learning from the case and i shared it with the other f1s and f2s so that they could also be aware of of the 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 things that can go wrong and how they can result in a significant event and then also i just think it's always useful to think about the swiss cheese model and how things can line up when you don't want them to line up in in a way to make an error or significant incident happen um so i think yeah for me i just learned a lot about how mistakes can happen and it actually doesn't take too many holes in the swiss cheese to line up in order for an event to to happen um so yeah it was a very important learning 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 opportunity for me when i went to coroner's court it was scary but it was good I actually did it. I went uh, the same week as my SD1 interview. Couldn't change the date of either of them, obviously, but it was a very busy week in my life. Anyway, um, and then they. this is a new question. How do you use similar reflective practice in your daily work? Um, wait, actually, just to go back to this, this is all, what's also new is the clinical event. So I know that last year it didn't say, or maybe the year before, it didn't say significant clinical event. It just said significant event. Um, and I think people were doing other things like talking about leadership and teaching, but they now have specified that they want it to be clinical. So make sure you just make it a clinical event and not don't talk about um, like someone. I remember doing a mock when someone said they'd organize this amazing teaching program, which was amazing and a, a great answer. But that kind of answer wouldn't now they say they want a clinical event. That kind of answer wouldn't be appropriate because that's not clinical. Um, but yeah, so now they've introduced this new question. How do you use similar reflective practice in your daily work? So um, you can relate it to the event. So for me, I am now very mindful of um, my documentation when I see patients because because it's very important. Um, I'm very mindful of when I look at results and I look at drug charts for patients because I understand the importance of it and how being not looking at them properly can can impact the patient. Um, escalating early um, and my reflections on escalating early have also changed um so just relate it back to that um then you can talk about the importance of reflection for yourself so like for me i find reflection really helpful to help me think about a patient in a wider context think about the different things that might be impacting the patient um but also thinking about your colleagues as well and how how they might be doing i think you you need to be quite reflective to be able to do that and and that's a skill that does develop i think after you when think different things happen and as you've been as you our work as you go through your career that develops um the kind of i think about the steps i think is a good thing to think about the steps you do to ensure you have time to reflect so taking breaks appropriately having lunch off the ward um that like having chats with colleagues those sorts of things are um implementing reflective practice in your daily work and then i also had to think about the different types of reflective practice so it might be debriefing and then whether it's just whether whether that's just thinking about something in your head or chatting to other people who are involved um talking to seniors or to your supervisor or doing a reflection on your e-portfolio but just remembering all of this to remain confidential even if you need to put that in in your answer just just be like i always make sure i maintain confidentiality just so that that's very clear to the interviewers as well and then also taking on the other side so instead of reflecting on sad things and things that have gone wrong but also thinking about things that have gone well so the importance of complimenting colleagues doing great exes highlighting good work uh, doing things like a positivity board those sorts of things are also really important and they are also reflections like i'm reflecting on my pa- my colleagues work and how they've done um and then again talk about the skills you've learned and the reflections you've made and how this is going to make you a better pediatrician so always just try and like project it to the future as well um 
so that's that's the four sections um and then they mark you they do the four marks and then what i was saying earlier was the only time they look back to your white space questions is if you're interview score and your total application score so basically if you you have the exact same marks as your interview score and your um if you have the exact same marks as some of your interview and your application then they look specifically at your each they prioritize each station so if you were to boss one station i would make it the communication one just because that's the first one they look at if you have the joint marks but i think it's quite i don't think it would be um very common to get into this um this part Actually, so I thought they go back to the white space questions, but they probably don't. They just look at your interview scores independently. And then after all the interviews are done, you will be starting to be sent offers on the 28th of March. Um, and you'll have 48 hours to then respond to an offer. Um, fine, let me just go back to that think like a pediatrician slide. So I was just thinking about in general, the sorts of things to think about, especially for the um, communication and the clinical scenario stations. So think about other things that might be going on for the patient, um, their siblings and the rest of the family, like um, especially at home, are the parents together? Do they live apart? How? What's the home condition? Do any of these things impact um, the child? School, so has the school attendance been affected by their condition if they have a chronic condition or have they been um is their attendance poor because they're not they just don't want to go to school in context of their illness um have they missed out on exams um are they do they have a long or dangerous commute or take, have to take a lot of buses and that's that that's impacting them think about friends like bullying feeling left out peer pressure or do those do those have a part to play in your scenario? These are just things I'm thinking about outside the box that might you might might be relevant. They might be none of these may apply, but some of them might be relevant to your scenarios. Things like compliance with medication. Um, are there any underlying reasons as to why they might not be compliant? Any contributing factors? And then always think about the MDT. So say you're in a scenario where the patient has poorly controlled asthma. Um, you could think about getting the asthma asthma specialist nurse to see them if your hospital has one um i guess actually my example of poorly controlled asthma is not a very good one but say they have a complex health problem um and they need more support then you can talk about the mdt you know we all love the mdt and play team is also a really useful one to so say they're really needle phobic say you might have a communication station where a patient just doesn't want to have bloods so you can think about who you can get involved in in the scenario to help you basically so the play team are always great and help distract and really help make it an easier easier experience um and then general tips so when you're preparing so i've kind of alluded to a lot of these but make sure you read the rcbch applicant guide which is what i um have done the screenshots for um watch the webinar on the rcbch youtube so if you go on the rcbch um page the applicant st1 page at the bottom there's a youtube channel um I, I, a lot of it is actually on the white space questions, but there is a little bit on the interview, but I would just have a listen and a read of that just in case there's any other hints in there. I did try and link in a few of those hints into this as well, but um, any tips as well. Um, I think, listen, so what I did, because I was on A&E when I had my interview, it was actually just as COVID was kicking off, uh, because it was February 2020 was my interview. Um, but I listened to 